Welcome to our early autumn garden tour around the plants that are bringing big impact to our small space right now. Early September downpours gave way to a week of record-breaking heat, then it was back to rain again. Then a little more sun. But despite continued twists and turns in the weather, late season flowers are flourishing and bees are busy doing their rounds. Autumn brings different sights, scents and sounds. Perennial shrubby salvia Josh is rather magnificently handsome right now. This plant has provided repeat waves of eye-catching coral red flower spikes since early July, but saved the best display for late September. And we're also appreciating its fresh feeling pear green foliage, which has filled out to about 60 centimetres high and wide. As you can see, Josh has put on impressive growth since the start of July and seems very content in a container, positioned in full sun with regular watering and free draining peat free compost. Come winter, we'll need to move this plant to a warm sheltered spot with our other shrubby salvias as pots make plant roots more vulnerable to temperature extremes and in spring we'll trim away any partially dead stems down to living green tissue and create a tidy framework for healthy growth next summer. Our other salvias help create interest with a layered mix of warm and cool tones, but colour perception is always relative. Josh glows like red lava, making salvia pink pong look a very pretty raspberry pink. But when pink pong is compared to the blue-toned magenta flowers of Salvia cerobitosi, it appears almost red. Meanwhile, our shy robin's vermilion feathers make Josh look positively pink. And this is why when buying a plant at the nursery, it can be useful to place it amongst other flowers to consider the effect of surrounding planting on perceived colour. Coral, scarlet, lava red, fiery red, Whatever the colour is called, we think it's pretty hot. Antirhinum, or snapdragon, is a traditional cottage garden flower, a sun-loving annual and in a mix of colours has an uplifting old-fashioned cheeriness. This is partly linked with childhood nostalgia and recollections of snapdragon conversations when you gently squeezed and released the size of the flower to open and close the dragon's mouth, making it say something silly to your playmate. Who would make their snapdragon give a silly reply? This particular reconnection with a simple childhood favourite began at the end of August, when we stood considering the raised bed under the bay tree. It had plenty of charm with the starry pale blue isotoma still flowering generously, but the pistachio coloured sedum heads had yet to infuse with autumnal richness and we suddenly felt as if this bed could do with an added late season colour injection. Enter snapdragons. These were bought in a modular seed tray from a local nursery already in flower. So there was the immediate satisfaction of introducing instant colour to the bed and seeing how these pollinator friendly flowers fast attracted bees.
I rather cram the snapdragons into small pots to fit around the edge of the raised bed, plus one for the patio area. But if planting into containers in May, these flowers would definitely benefit from a far more generously sized pot for longevity through to autumn and to help retain the constant moisture they need to thrive. As childhood nostalgia for these plants continued, I thought about the last year of primary school. There was a classroom phase of surreptitiously dropping anonymous notes, confessing your crush on the desk of the person you had feelings for, and they were usually written on scraps of paper, beginning, roses are red, violets are blue, and then variations of, I hate homework, but I love you. You know the kind of thing. One day, I found a snapdragon flower left on the desk with eyes drawn on in felt tip. Inside, someone had written, love you. At least I think that's what it said. It was pretty smudged. And the thing was, the desk was communal, shared with another girl and two boys. So we never knew who left it there or who the message was really intended for. But the humor of it still makes me smile to this day. And perhaps that's why I have particular affection for these colourful flowers. Xanthos was a new addition to our seed-grown summer annuals this year, and I'm pretty sure it's won a permanent place in our hearts. It is the most floriferous container cosmos we've ever raised. Its soft primrose yellow petals have been flowering since May with a sweetly understated charm, and like all cosmos, it's a magnet for pollinators. This plant loves full sun and on the other side of the patio where it's become shaded by larger plants it has lost its naturally tidy habit and put energy into stretching for the light. It still looks beautiful in its own wild way and I'm hoping that if I raise it up onto an upturned pot this will encourage more flower buds to form. Rubenza is another gorgeous annual cosmos. It's been flowering generously since June, with petals that make an impact from a distance and then draw you close to appreciate the subtle shifts in each individual flower. Opening in a rich, dark ruby, it gradually brightens to a strong rose and then fades to dusky pink. Cosmos White Sensation has a simple, delightful elegance and at the end of a busy working day, it always feels as if just to sit amongst these flowers and watch the visiting evening bees immediately relaxes away the stress of a hectic world. White Sensation works really well with blue-toned blooms and as a bright foil amongst darker flowers like Salvia Armistad.
With autumn underway, summer plants have grown taller and looser in structure, and this height creates a lovely, softly enveloping and romantic atmosphere. But a little architecture is also needed to provide definition. The box balls are still looking sharp, but we've trimmed the fast-growing rosemary into crisper shape for the second time this year, even though the trade-off will potentially be fewer flowers in spring. The heady scent of rosemary makes this a very pleasant job. We remove faded buddlier flower heads and trim back spent salvia flower stems to the first set of leaves to keep energy going into flower bud production. And deadheading cosmos is also essential to keep the plants looking good and flowering as long as possible. I've been combing through our Buxus topiary balls each week with a fine-tined hand rake to remove the voracious box tree caterpillars hatching courtesy of the pesky box tree moth, which was scarcely a presence this summer, but has now returned in droves. The moths hang from shrubs and trees with a superior, rather taunting air, invariably just out of reach. On the subject of pests, I don't usually find slugs cute, but this colour-coordinated slug masquerading as part of the pot handle was sort of adorable. The slug is much too big for this year's juvenile frogs to eat. And another important job here is to check the lawn carefully before mowing, because there are often frogs concealed in the grass. An unexpected September visitor, never seen in the garden before, was this newt, which emerged from a gap in the brick edging when I lifted up a pot. Frogs like to shelter in gaps in the brickwork too, and this goes to show that our hard landscaping can offer ecological value, especially if we allow a few weeds to flourish there. On close inspection, our lawn is a tapestry of weeds. I love the swathes of white daisies in May, And the wood pigeon's favourite snack right now is clover leaves. Exquisite exotic Melianthus major is a half hardy, highly architectural subshrub originating from South Africa. And amidst all the free forms of oversized late season flower stalks, it provides a contrasting, clearly defined focal point amongst the mini forest of cosmos and salvia. The cool grey green foliage appears sharply serrated, but is entirely gentle to touch or brush past. At dusk, the leaves take on an ethereal metallic quality. It grows well in a container, but needs winter protection in our frost pocket location, 
However, we rather enviously see these plants overwinter successfully in the ground in mild, sunny, well-drained English gardens, retaining their evergreen foliage, which can be trimmed back in early spring to encourage bushy growth. Rub the leaves and they release the delicious scent of peanut butter. But the foliage itself must be far from tasty because these leaves are the most perfect unnibbled specimens in our entire garden, untouched by slug, snail, cricket, earwig, caterpillar or any other hungry creature. Sun-loving perennial Salvia Armistad flowers from June, but I think looks its absolute best in the autumn when the soft mellow light illuminates rich purple petals, creating a beautiful contrast with fresh green foliage and dark calices. There is not just the aromatic foliage and soothing hum of visiting bees to enjoy, but the papery rustle of calices as shorter-tongued bumblebees create holes at the base of the petals to access nectar. The sound makes me think of sweet wrappers being opened. Once established in the ground, this salvia is highly drought tolerant and it performs brilliantly in containers, but will need watering regularly during dry spells. It can grow up to a metre and a half, almost five feet in height, and requires winter protection in all but the mildest areas of the UK. In Spanish, amistad means friendship, making this the perfect context to thank you, our YouTube friends, old and new, who support, subscribe to and engage with our channel. Until next time, we wish you all flowerful times and nature-soothed minds. Mm-hmm.